could we celebrate what we've accomplished and sort of sit up straight right now? We're going to do just a super brief exercise. We sit up straight. And if you can, scooch toward the ed edge of your seat. And take yoga, yoga. Take, <laughs> take a deep, feel it in your toenail breath through the stomach. Quick repeat. Thank you very much. Have you ever had a conversation that you both really appreciated and at the same time you were so frustrated by it you can scream. <laughs> yes. As in there's a part of your mind that thinks, oh gosh, that's really good wisdom. Oh, I wish they would stop talking. <laughs> so many, many years ago, I had this type of conversation with a mentor. It's when I was first starting out in sales, it's when I was first starting out in public speaking. And my mission with this particular speech at the time was to persuade the audience over some type of sales approach. And my ego was pretty inflated, to say the least. And I went to my mentor who watched the speech. And I said, you know, so how fantastic was I? <laughs> Something to that effect. And she paused and just looked at me. And then at that point, it's the pregnant pause, and so you know what's coming. You're like, oh, I'm going to get egg in my face. And she said, okay, so this was a persuasive speech, right, Jill? And I said, yes. And she said, the language you used, and this relates, I think, to Jessica's great exercises, the language you used was absolutely precise. It was very clear. Semicolon. <laughs> she then said, but your perspective, you treated your perspective, you delivered your perspective as if it was the only perspective in the room. You also, regarding vocal variety, had zero variety, which if you really analyze that, indicates to the audience that you know what, you're not really into your own game. You're not really buying what you're quote trying to sell. And I use sell as a general verb, I don't mean you know brass tacks, sales, but believability, good old-fashioned believability. And then thirdly, she said, and you know what, and this blew my mind, and frankly, this next statement is the one thing that I hope all of us are able to retain. And I have some documentation, one page documentation to share later, but she said, and thirdly, you did not give the audience a chance to be the audience. You spoke so fast because you were having your own little conversation with yourself on that stage, and your ego was a really humbling type of conversation. But she said, and your ego was the only game in town, and I guarantee you that A, the audience picked up on it, and B, this will be a no sales day. And C, the worst part, and this really relates, I think, to the ultimate endeavor of what Jessica taught us, zero trust was forged. Okay, so as much as I would like, as much as my ego would like to forget that that conversation ever occurred, it was pivotal and it has affected me with my own development and certainly the type of development that I want to bring to clients. So let's take a deep breath. <laughs> I won't lie, it's more for my benefit than yours. <laughs> I was a jackass in front of them, in front of the audience. Thank you very much. So what I want to do here is do a, a brief, excuse me, drive-by lightning talk on how to translate the type of clarity that we worked with earlier and translate that to developing our persuasive public speaking skill. So it's going to be a little bit light course, but I want to approach it from content development, vocal strength, and the power of silence. First and foremost, whenever we approach a persuasive dynamic, and that absolutely, that absolutely can be a one-on-one -on -one dynamic like we were engaging in earlier, or it can certainly, obviously, be a one-to-stage dynamic also. Whenever you are preparing and brainstorming 
for a persuasive public speech, I ask that you pivot your thinking, your initial thinking, around four questions. And these questions, and I'll hand them out to you here in just a moment, these questions pivot around raising your own awareness, right? Mm -hmm. Whenever we deliver a speech, it's so easy to feel confident about what we're saying, but it's so difficult, I'm going to join you here, it's so difficult to sit where the audience is sitting, to perceive your confidence as the audience will perceive it. It's incredibly difficult, and these four questions, especially from a persuasive public speech point of view, have really helped developing content. One is be absolutely clear on the perspective that you represent. And going back to that painful but useful conversation with my mentor, at the time, I represented multiple points of view to that audience because I wanted to be their friend. Mm -hmm. The contrast is key. You need to represent something so you can invest your energy in sharing why you think that is worth your time and has relevant to the audience. And then second question is, before you walk into the room with your audience, again, whether the audience is a single person or if it's a group of people, be clear on the potential points of view that they could adopt. And again, I think this goes back to the searing statement that my mentor made of, hey Jill, it was like you thought your perspective was the only game in town. It's just not. If the goal is to forge trust, if the goal is to even get an opposing view to listen, then we need to know that that perspective ideally is in the room. Thirdly, in preparing a persuasive speech, it's really, really useful to be aware of what's at stake in the conversation from a best case scenario and worst case scenario. And literally, this can translate to what we were doing earlier. We were having one-on-one -on -one conversations. And you know what? What if I was, the worst case scenario is, let's say, whenever Eric and I were talking and I was staring at the ceiling. <laughs> and pretty disengaged. Okay, worst case scenario is that would impact her trust, frankly, and her interest in investing time in getting, in, in getting to know this person named Jill and forging some sort of substantive relationship. Okay, so that's worst case. Or best case is, hey, if I am cognizant of my content, if I deliver with integrity and authenticity, there's a high likelihood that the seeds of trust will be planted and then relationships will unfold and by golly, they're gonna to wanna to listen to a potential deal, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to make it so crass as public speaking can be so transa transactional. It is not. It's full of nuance as relationship building can be. But it's more than just having that clear, clear message, the clear elevator pitch, the clear cocktail line, excuse me, is without a doubt, useful. You're practicing clarity. But it goes beyond that. The fourth question that I find really compelling, especially when fleshing out a persuasive speech, is how does emotional resolve benefit my cause or detour from it? For instance, if you are giving, if you are planning a persuasive speech to, tossing this out, a bunch of conservatives, and you happen to be a middle of the road, it's, let's say it's a political environment, and you happen to be sharing a perspective that's more middle of the road versus full-fledged conservatism, what emotional mindset do you want to bring into the room? Does it want to, do you want to be defensive? Do you even know if you're defensive? Mm -hmm. And so even those questions can be really hard to answer in present time, <coughs> training yourself mentally, envisioning what opposition would look like, before game day is critical, and I really think making an authentic impact pivots a lot around that fourth point. Mm -hmm. So again, I know this is a quick drive, walk, drive by excuse me, on public speaking. From a vocal point of view, and from the point of view of really framing and heightening meaning, even when we're in one-on-one -on -one conversation, the tenor of our voice can be both a repellent and it can be so intoxicating. 
and frankly, on the one hand, I hear myself say that, I think, well, duh, <laughs> obviously. But when our adrenaline is up, when we want to deliver, our systems will naturally, mental and physical, will turn on that adrenaline switch, right? And we can either respond to it by fear, and this is not meant to sound condescending, it's just a part of mental training. Uh, I mean, I was nervous to really further flesh out my cocktail line, and there's no reason to be nervous. It's a process, and that deliverance is a process in speaking also. So, knowing the depth of your voice, and the range where it can go up like really this, if I'm really, really frustrated, she's not listening to me. Or, I hear what you're saying, I want to continue this conversation, and I'm not leaving until we reconcile X. So there's a difference, and to know that you have the choice and the ability to manipulate your voice is critical. The last thing that I want to sign off on that has made a heap of difference whenever speaking with clients or a larger audience, or certainly, certainly in helping to develop public speakers myself, is being cognizant of silence and how, A, that can frame meaning and this gets into a tricky nuance, but B, how it is a sign of acceptance from speaker to audience. And by that I mean, you don't have to do anything but sit there and you're okay. I don't have to talk at her to validate myself as a speaker. If I want her to remember, let's say, sorry, I don't mean to throw you on the bus. If I want her to remember the validity and the merit of silence in amplifying a message, in quote, teaching someone to listen, then I better find some way as a speaker to exercise my ability to listen to her. And I can do that by looking at her straight in the face and being silent and then moving on to you and to you and to you. This is a fantastic, if not fabulous, indeed it is a fabulous group. I believe in what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. If there are any questions, please ask. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to hand these out and thank you very much.